Welcome to our final session of today, which I hope will have a bit of a reflective flavour to it, but in, an, in a, perhaps a different kind of seriousness as well as a wee bit of play. So no pressure. I'm really excited to be able to welcome uh, Eileen Merriman and Renee Liang and Glenn Colhoun um, to our conference, who, all of whom are writers who doctor. So I just wanted to, and I've, I've done it like that on purpose, because I'm really interested in yourselves as writers who happen also to be doctors rather than the other way around. And so what we've asked um, of the three of um, them is to give us a reading, um, to each of them, to start us off. And then we've just got a few questions to trigger a conversation uh, between them and with you. And you can still use Slido for questions and stuff. And then we'll close the session with another reading from each of them as well, which I think will be a really great way for us to uh, round off the day and send us away to dinner full of thoughts and interesting ideas. So who, have you decided who's going first? Okay. okay. I mean, I, I had social anxiety and I Do you want to go? Yes, I do. Okay, all right. So, um, sorry, that came out really loud. So I'm going to read from my recently released book, The Silence of Snow, um, which centres around two junior doctors. One's an anaesthetic fellow, actually, Rory McBride. He's nearly finished his training. Um, and just before he came to work at Nelson Hospital, a patient has died under his care, and he's quite traumatised by that. And the other doctor is a first-year house surgeon, Jodie Waterstone. Um, and although it's slightly a spoiler alert, I thought I would read to you from the scene, his flashback back to this time when this patient died under his care. So he's just finished a week of night shifts. He's coming towards the end. It's nearly 8 o'clock. And his um, anaesthetic colleague has rung in and said, look, I'm running really late. Can you start my elective list? And this is an eight-year-old child. The first half of the operation went to plan. Rory put the girl to sleep, slipped a laryngeal mask down her throat, and hooked her up to the gas that would keep her under for as long as the surgeon needed to operate. The beep, beep, beep of the machine tracking Taylor Newman's heartbeat was soothing. So soothing, Rory felt his vision grey a couple of times. Don't fall asleep. Just don't. You all right there, the anaesthetic tech asked? Yeah. Rory pinched the tops of his thighs and blinked. It's been a long night. A line from a favourite poem popped into his head, one about having miles to go before he slept. Actually, it would probably be an hour and a half, give or take, before he'd get to sleep, by the time he drove home and gobbled down some breakfast. As soon as he thought of food, his mouth began to water. When did he last eat in? He didn't think he'd had much more than a pottle of yoghurt since dinner the night before. Rory never felt like eating much on night shift, but now he was starving. He punched his thighs again, checked the girl's observations. Pulse, blood pressure, oxygen. Bed, I just want to go to bed. The surgeon's voice seemed as though it was coming from far off. Farewell tonsils, Donny said. Rory jerked to attention. Okie dokie, God, how long had he zoned out for? Surely it was only seconds. He began to lighten the anaesthetic, bringing the girl back from La La Land. Oh, to be coasting on a cloud of sever fluorine. A couple of minutes later, the beeping, which had been slow and steady throughout, sped up. Rory's eyes strayed towards the machine. The girl's pulse rate had jumped from 82 to 105. What? That was when he saw the falling oxygen level, the flatlined shape of the carbon dioxide trace. Shit. Rory whipped a stethoscope off the bench and slapped the diaphragm over the kid's chest. Silence. No air moving at all. Laryngeal spasm, it had to be. The vocal cords had clamped shut, so nothing could move in or out. The girl must have blood on her vocal cords. Or maybe she'd regurgitated her stomach contents into her throat. Damn it, damn it. Donnie Yang's voice intruded into his consciousness. Everything all right there? Can you step away for a sec? Rory dialed the oxygen up and started ventilating the girl using a bag and mask. What do you mean, step away? Yang looked indignant. I'm nearly done here. Exactly what I said. Rory's voice was tight. I'm trying to manage a laryngeal spasm. Can you stop poking and prodding her? He nodded at the anaesthetic tech. Can you dial up the gas? Rory went through all the steps he'd been taught as a junior registrar. Check the airway for blood, deepen the anaesthesia, muscle relaxant, give 100% oxygen. The oxygen level came up. The carbon dioxide trace normalised. Rory secured Taylor Newman's airway with another tube, which went down with no hassle, thank God. He gave Donnie permission to touch Taylor again, and the surgeon finished sewing the girl up. Rory did to think of sleep again, 
even though he was now feeling very, very awake. It was when he was taking the second tube out of the girl's throat that he saw the blood. Not a lot, just a trace of foamy bubbles on the end of the tube. But the girl seemed fine apart from a marginally low oxygen level. Well, the blood was no surprise. Tonsillectomies were always a bloody business. Either that or Rory had scraped something on the way down. It had been a while since he'd had to manage a laryngeal spasm, but he had done all right. Not just all right, he'd managed it perfectly. Rory was wheeling the girl to recovery when his phone rang. It was Simon, thank God, just in time for the second case. Rory went home and slept like a dead person. He didn't learn about the cardiac arrest until the following evening, about the post-obstructive fluid on the lungs that Rory should have, but hadn't, picked up on. It took Taylor Newman two days to die. Rory had been dying a slow death ever since. Okay, I'm not sure how I'm going to follow that. Um, before I begin, I need to ask if anyone in the audience is uncomfortable talking about body parts. Raise hands. You're welcome to um, quietly leave if you need to. For most of my adult life, boobs were an accessory. Useful for patting tops and bouncing gently, hopefully seductively, as I moved about my business. I liked them. They were B-size, and they fitted the Goldilocks conditions. Not too big and not too small. My middle sister was flat-chested, not that she ever cared, but I was quite smug that I did not suffer from this problem. Ditto for my poor friends with tits so huge they complained no one ever looked in their faces. Of course, society and fashion being what they are, there were times when I needed my boobs to be bigger, so I had an arsenal of push-up or push-together bras. I remember my triumph the day a bra shop attendant showed me how to correctly get into a bra. Everyone, uh, half the audience will know this. Um, lean forward, flip up and present like little wobbly jellies on the special input cushions. I could even achieve a kind of cleavage if I subtly squeezed my shoulders <laughs> so that my boobs got squashed between them. I used to practice in front of the mirror before going out. So, I got pregnant. The veins on the chest, sorry, big, big jump in time. Uh, not related to the bras. Um, or partially related to the bras. Um, the veins on the chest were actually the giveaway. Being the doctor I was, my mind, it, uh, my mind ticked panic-stricken through a number of possible causes, including high blood pressure, tumour and clots, before I decided to buy a pregnancy test from the supermarket. With the pregnancy that became my daughter, my boobs swelled cartoonishly from the second month with growing pains to match the speed of inflation. My flat-chested sister, who by now had become a breast surgeon, go figure, sent me an email advising me in her no-nonsense authoritative way, some of you guys actually know her, so this will not surprise you, to scrub my nipples with something tough. According to her, this was the only way to prepare my boobs for the trauma of breastfeeding. I sheepishly loofered a few times and then forgot as other pregnancy worries took precedence. I remember my first night with a newborn, all mouth and tiny limbs and different pillow positions. I had spent hours teaching new mums to breastfeed, but with my own it was different. I fully expected karma to kick in and to have problems with milk supply, with latching, with reflux, but I was lucky, one of the lucky ones. Even the nipple cracking was minor compared to the bliss of having a small, warm mouth, eagerly clamped down, tongue, chin and ear, all moving in rhythm. I never knew before I had my own children that they sigh in satisfaction after they have a bellyful of warm milk. And both my children purr, yes purr, when presented with booby, and I will write a paper on that one day. Um, <laughs> My B-sized days are a distant memory as I sling my E-sized beauties into <laughs> maternity bras. I now have breasts worthy of the term hooters. <laughs> the problem is now too much cleavage rather than too little. I even have to vet my clothing choices, not only for how much they reveal up top, but also for colour. Too light, and the dreaded wet patch is obvious. Dark tops work well, but then after it dries, there are elegant little tidal marks of milk. Um, there is basically no solution for this. Probably too much information, but anyone who's lasted this long can probably take it. 
One thing people never tell you about breasts is what excellent alarm clocks they make. If I was out without my daughter, at the three hour mark, boom, my breasts would explode, straining outwards. If I was sleeping, I got woken up. It got so I could tell the time by my breasts. And I'll leave you on that note. Glenn. Well, that's two impossible acts to follow. Um, letter to a young nurse. Conversations with a zip man for Jess. A young man asked me once why poetry was important. He especially wanted to know why it was important to doctors and nurses. What could it bring to this world of sadness and breaking and people dying? How could it compare to cutting out an old and broken heart only to replace it with one that might leap upwards and grab life by the throat. I told him that I wasn't really sure, but I had a hunch it made us look at things differently, brought context, stopped the world sometimes and asked what it was we thought we were doing. It helped us to remember. I told him that it looked kindly on all moments as equal, did not separate them into those worthwhile and those not. As if to make the point in looking about for inspiration, I told him that it might, for example, at that very instant draw attention to the lie of his shoelace against his shoe, the light on his face, the way the zip on his bag full of books hung in just the way it did right then, at his feet. I said that all those things were telling us something, and that poetry was a way of listening as much as it was a way of saying. He asked me with a smile what his zip might be saying, and so I adjusted my ear. As it swung almost imperceptibly from the gape of his bag, I thought I saw it smile too, with the sudden attention. It seemed as though it had waited a long time to interrupt the world of men. And while the room listened, that small person inside the zip told me his story. He said that he was made of nickel, and that nickel is an atom made up of 28 protons, neutrons, and electrons, and that it was forged by fusing the nuclei of increasingly heavier atoms together in a giant star towards the end of its life. Most likely, that star exploded just over four billion years ago. Our planet was formed from the leftovers, although further nickel deposits might have been carried into its mantle by meteorites, of course. The nickel was dug up at some point, then melted and placed into a mould designed to join things together. To observe him hanging where he was at that very instant, the zip man said a number of processes must have first taken place. Human beings must have evolved, developed baggage, designed fastening systems to help secure such and the technology needed to make these. They must have dug the nickel he was made of from the earth and shaped it and sold it to the person who sewed together the bag from which he hung. I must also have walked past just when his bag was sitting where it was and gravity and the spinning of the earth must have exerted, exerted a force on him so that he hung downwards to catch the light of the sun, which reflected off, the surf, off his surface and into my eyes. For this to happen, the zip man went on, the sun, travelling at 720,000 kilometres per hour, had to be in just the right position relative to the earth which was spinning at 1,600 kilometres per hour. To top that all off, the young man and I had to be conscious and sentient, 
and able to ask the questions that we had. He pointed out also that each step in this chain required a thousand smaller steps to take place in order to bring it to the point where it could be part of his journey as well, which made the conversation we were having then even less likely and more remarkable. Other complex atoms created along with nickel at the death of the same star would have included carbon, he said. Given that all the significant biochemical reactions in animal and plant life make use of carbon, this atom would have required a certain amount of time and self-organisation to become part of those pathways. Then it would have had to find itself contained within a cellular structure, had that cell stumble across a way of reproducing itself and finally evolve into a multicellular organism capable of self-reflection. With this consideration in mind, the zip man went on to point out that we are at times something we cannot see. Our little is too little, and our big is too big. And that poetry helps us to at least sit with these things now and then, in the way that we do when we are sad, or in love, or saying goodbye, or being amazed, or watching the light hit a small zip used to fasten a bag at the feet of a young man, only to find oneself at a loss to explain its weight and being and the way it hangs quietly towards the floor as though it was something servile, simple, and completely insignificant. Every moment, he said, is really a history of the universe. He fell silent then, and for a time we stood and simply regarded each other before the sun and its light and the earth and its spinning moved us away from each other. I felt for a moment a great compassion for myself and for all things I was part of. It was as though someone had cut out my old and broken heart and replaced it with one that leapt upwards then and grabbed me by the throat with a wild and urgent hand. Um, thank you. If, if you want to talk to us about why you decided to choose that particular piece, you can, but you don't have to. Uh, my big question to start this conversation is if you could talk to us and to each other about how you came to writing, or how writing came to you. Um, kind of why you do it, really. Why do you write? Because, you know, you, you, you all have day jobs. So, um, or is writing your day job? But anyway, yeah. How, how did you get, how did you find writing? Okay. Um, I always wrote um, until I was about 18, so I was just, even when I was at high school, and I knew I wanted to do medicine as well, but I was writing chapters of this fantasy novel and giving them to one of my friends in chemistry class, and she was always hanging out for the next chapter, and then I got swallowed up in trying to get into medical school. Um, I was just remembering the conversation from earlier today. I went to a Desol 3 school, and getting into medical school was not easy, um, and so I did a whole degree first, um, did medicine, and to cut a long story short, by the time I came to the, all the end of my training and went to North Shore Hospital. Um, 17 years had gone by and I hadn't been writing. And my first year was actually pretty horrible because I hadn't trained in Auckland. I was an Otago trainee. No one knew me. I didn't know them. And I had huge imposter syndrome. And I remember when I was first on call and someone rang up asking advice. I think they were from general medicine. And I thought, why are they asking me for advice? I don't think I know more than they do. And I was wrong, but I, I didn't know that I was wrong. So. Um, I, about six months in, I said to my husband, I want to quit medicine, and he went, well, just give it a year. And, and I got to the end of that horrible year, and I thought, well, I'll either have um, a nervous breakdown or quit medicine or try and adjust, try and find some balance. So I just sat down, and it was just before Christmas, and started writing, and, and all of a sudden I realised that this was something that was part of me that I had lost, and it made me escape. I, I, I forgot about everything else when I was doing it, and, um, and when I finished, I, it was as if I'd done some meditation or, or something like that, and, I, and nothing else makes me feel like that. Um, 
And then I started getting placed in short story competitions and things, and then I realised I was actually quite good at this, and I did a creative writing course. So that's cutting a long story short, but now I write all the time. I've had six books published through Penguin Random House, um, and I've got four more signed up, so that's why I write. <laughs> Uh, so, I, I guess on the question of why I write, I'm just like Eileen, I can't help myself. They're like, um, it's like a, it's like these little bubbles everywhere and I kind of have to go and grab them and pop them. You know, it's, it's, this, it's this uncontrollable urge. Um, and I'm very unhappy if I can't. Um, but if you ask me about the question of why I'm a writer, I can give you two versions of the story. One version is that my grandfather gave me a name which meant literary blossom, uh, because he thought there were too many writers in the family, it turns out. Uh, sorry, doc too many doctors in the family, it turns out. Uh, but I didn't get told this until my mum casually remarked when I was in fourth year medical school the one day. I was like, what? You know, like, my entire destiny has been wrong. And so um, I wrote a poem about this, and, and uh, clearly that, that made me into a writer. Um, but, but the other story um, that I'm going to tell you, because it's relevant to the theme, is... is I was a burnt out registrar. I was, um, you know, at, I was in my so-called dream job, in my training, and I was not happy. And I could see that, you know, your entire training, um, you think that you're going to be happy when you get that golden ticket, you know, the um, FRACP, and suddenly you're a consultant, and it's going to be rainbows and unicorns for the rest of your life. And um, and I could clearly see that was actually a lie and that, in fact, the real situation was at that big ladder that you're climbing towards the wall. When you get over the wall, what you're going to see is the next ladder. And then when you climb that wall, you're going to see the next ladder after that. And I was like, OK, so I also have this uncontrollable urge to be a writer and I'm really starting to resent medicine. Um, so the best thing I can do is give myself a sabbatical. So I got... I literally got my letter telling me I had my fellowship and I resigned. Um, I, you know, because, you know, I'd done my, I'd done my work. Well, I finished the run and then I resigned. And then um, I didn't ever apply for a job as a consultant uh, and, and enrolled in a Master of Creative Writing. Um, and that turned out to be quite good timing because at the time they were looking for, I guess, the... Uh, sort of the Chinese New Zealand story. They were looking around for people who were telling that story and I got quite a lot of attention um, quite early on, people, you know, more than probably would have been uh, justified at my level. And so it kind of continued and, and um, I, as you can sort of see from my CV, I've got a bit of a jack of all trades. I've written um, and toured eight plays. I've written um, operas. Um, uh, I've written... Um, uh, a non-fiction collection, which I've just read from. And, and most of this has kind of... I sort of tell people I wrote a few plays by accident and also an opera by accident. But it's not an accident, it's a drive. So, um, and then, interestingly, and we'll talk about this, um, because I did writing, I came back to medicine. So I'll leave it at that. Um, I think, you know... Uh, it's a very broad question, and I ask myself sometimes why I became a writer. Um, I guess I fell, I fell in love, not so much with writing, but with words uh, as a young man. And I grew up in South Auckland, and, and that was my landscape. And there wasn't a lot of writing there, you know, um, except for the page three girl and the Sunday, Sunday news it was back then. That My dad always used to read that. And... Um, uh, but words were used all the time. I grew up in the Seventh-day Adventist church, so it was very much an oral culture. So people would stand up all the time and talk, church talk. Um, we would argue uh, around the Bible um, as young people on texts and the exegesis and what it meant. And, and so I grew up with argument and debate within the Adventist church in hymns and old people giving testimony in the Bible, somebody preaching every week. Um, so I, I knew that words could move people and, and words were dynamic. They could change shape of things. Um, you could get into trouble with them or out of trouble. Um, and that they, that, 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 that they were powerful. And I, I, I loved their symmetry and their, their chic and their, 
they they were sexy, you know. I loved the way they wiggled themselves, really. Um, uh, and outside of that, I went to school, and half the school when I was there in the early 70s was was brown, and language has been bent again uh, between Pacifica languages and English. So you had these wonderful phraseologies and and um, and Pacifica people had great ways of putting things and and Māori were moving into the city as well and so language was used in the playground all the time. And I was watching MASH on TV and Hogan's <laughs> Heroes and I Love Lucy and all these cheeky things and going to work with my dad who was a builder and he would be with his plumber mate and his brick lane mate and they used language in funny ways and um, I loved all the ways that language appeared in oral, in the oral traditions, I suppose. Then when I went to school, I discovered poetry and guys like Hone Tufari and Jim Baxter and using language that I, well, Baxter, not so much language I recognise, but he made, there's such a beautiful music in his language and, and Tufari, there are those were poems that I, I recognised the language in that, you know, a piece of poetry that can say, give me back me fucking marbles, you kids, um, <laughs> was straight out of South Auckland, um, which is a line of two fuddies. So, um, and all the churchiness, the King James Version-ness of it, you know, which is still a sexy old beast, you know, and, and a lovely white, full of poetries. And so I always, yeah, in that context, you think I'll grow up and be a minister because that's what you see, that's where you see words used. Um, but then... I started training to be a minister and the Seventh-day Adventist Church asked me to reconsider my calling. <laughs> Which I'm still doing and, if you're not careful, I may come back. Um, yeah, yeah, and there will be an offering after this too. Yeah. Uh, um, so, yeah, I, I, um, I, I did an English degree, I fell in love fully with writing and literature then and sitting in, you know, Roger Horrocks 21st century poetry class and I really got lost listening to poems from around the world as you're sort of, that's what you do all day, it's so great. Um, but many false starts to try and write and all the motivations really there, I'd like to think there's a couple of high and mighty but you know, I'm a young man, you want to get the girl, you write them a poem, you know. And I always think, let's be honest, you write boys to get the girl, you know. Um, <laughs> to, <laughs> um, to impress, to, you know, dreams of glory and, and riches and, yeah. And um, so there's all those motivations and to have a voice and... Um, but over time, it took me a long time to start writing, and like you, Eileen, I stopped writing through medical school because it, it, it squeezes language out of you. Um, and a cardiac surgeon, I really wish I knew who this person was, in third year, uh, um, uh, gave us a lecture on, on, on the coronary arteries, and at the end of it, he put up a, um, an overhead projection of a poem, just an English pastoral poem about the English landscape. I don't know the poet, and I've forgotten all of it, but I just, we were all writing the poem down until someone said, sir, is this gonna be in the exam? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and he said, no, 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 this is just a poem, it's a big year, and you all know the coursing pathways of the 12 cranial nerves um, and the holes they go through in the skull. Uh, this is a poem just to remind you um, that there's more to life than neuroanatomy and cardiac anatomy. And it just rocked me back. It felt like being back in Roger Horrocks' lecture. And I thought then, mm, it was one of those road, on, road to Damascus things, eh? and I thought if I don't write, I might go down the medicine hole and never come out. So I started to write then. The end of the story is all those, I, I was a, I'm a lazy writer, poems are short, but from doing it over and over and over and over again, then it became like something I can't stop. It wasn't at first, it took quite a lot of effort and discipline and doing it over and over again and not trying too hard 
just having fun. And then now it's something that I'm irritable if I don't do it. Um, and I think lots of things in our lives are like that. And now what makes me right is because it, because of the zip man, you know? Because you can be sitting and see a zip and fall in love with the zip. And the zips can talk to you and the world sparkles and pops. And poetry is the art of the moment. So every moment becomes riveting. Um, and that's why I always tell people, don't be flattered if a poet falls in love with you. They fall in love with zips and rubbish bins <laughs> and the telegraph pole. And yeah, it's, that is a charge. Yeah, and I, you will have felt that at times. And in poetry, you practice doing that over and over and over again until you, you see the atomic structure of things before you, the electron transfer chain stripping its oxygen, charging up your ATP to speak and think, and to, to be able to see the minutia of life. Like if I stop writing, I stop thinking, I stop seeing it. So in some ways it becomes a martial art and the writing is just what washes up on the beach, if that makes sense. Okay, so next question. Um, what does writing mean to you as a person who also works as a doctor and how do those disciplines bounce off each other, complement each other, get in the way of each other? So that interface between the person who writes and the person who doctors. And also, I do have lots of questions, but if you have questions of your own, just slide our away. Um, I... I actually think I'm doing the same thing. I, I get asked this question a lot, like how do you do manage to do all these many different jobs? And I go, I'm actually pulling the wool over everyone's eyes, I'm using exactly the same skill set in each one. And if you let me explain, I mean, we take histories. <laughs> um, a patient comes in and we ask, the first thing we do after introducing ourselves is ask them, what's your story? And then we listen very carefully to that story. And, and then our job is to listen carefully and then reflect back that story at them in a way that will make sense to them. And then we collaborate with them on potentially changing some plot points in that story that they've told us. So this is, this is I, I hope that I have agreement in the room, this is actually what we're doing in, the medical, in our medical practice. And of course there's some other stuff in there, you know, so we use other techniques to get more information, just like a writer would, doing research. But I do the same thing, whether I'm writing or um, seeing patients, or indeed doing research. I'm trying to get the story, the real story, the layers of the story, and therefore, the skill sets that I'm using are very transferable. So what I found was that because I was a specialist before I became, went back to writing, um, because like um, uh, Eileen and Glenn, I kind of let it lay fallow and lost a lot of my skill sets um, when I was studying medicine, because it does suck it out of you. Um, the, I, I found that the skills that I'd been growing as a doctor were very, very useful in my new career as an artist. Um, you know, all these things, you know, being able to listen, being able to see under the layers, questioning what the real story was, not believing the first story the patient tells you, understanding that they're trying to tell you something else when they tell you that first story, all of those things. Plus the, you know, the need to quest, the need to advocate, for the real, the real story, because as an arts producer, which I am, you often do have to push a little bit for resources to tell the story. And so, you know, they are very transferable skills. Yeah, um, I totally agree with Renee, and, and people look, often say to me, how can you fit in a full-time job in writing? And part of it's that, well, it's like an itch, you've got to scratch, so I just do. Um, so. On the way to the airport today, I was in a taxi, so I had my notebook and pen because I got bored. So I, I went, oh, well, I might as well do some writing because I don't have much time. <laughs> and, and, and I love plane trips, so I write on the plane. Um, 
Sometimes if we're away, it's not very sociable to sit around writing, so I might get out my phone when I'm still in bed in the morning and I might be writing on my docs to go which links with my computer and I can edit that later. Um, but, but I say to people too, well look, I studied for fellowship exams just like a lot of you know, people in this room. Um, you're used to doing your full-time job and then going home and, and doing something else. And it's, for me, it's not actually work anyway because I love it. So, so I'll, I'll be in the lounge with my laptop and I still have time to spend with my family, but I do grab every last little moment to try and write. Um, and, and yes, I'm used to working to a deadline. Um, sometimes it's really crazy. You're talking about how we balance it. I wanted to cut down. I wanted to lose a day even every second week and then um, was asked if I'd be clinical director of our department. So I managed to dodge that for two years and then the, the person who was clinical director and stepping down just said, well, I'm going now, I'm retiring. And, and everyone turned around and looked at me again. And, and then everyone said, we're not doing it. And then eventually I went, oh, okay. So, so now I'm working harder than ever in my day job. Um, but also my writing career is also on an upward trajectory, um, so there's a lot to do, and there's a lot I want to give back to both communities. So I'm a thrombosis expert, that's my subspecialty in haematology, I'm on international boards, etc., and I love that, but also in the writing community I'm asked to do quite a lot of um, teaching and this and that, quite apart from editing my books and things. So yeah, it's a real juggling act. I think if I took my foot off the accelerator too much, then I would um, get bored. But at the same time, every now and then I get a frenetic week where I've got a medical conference and I've got two books that are editing at once have come in for proofreading and this and that. But you know, so um, I don't think I could quit medicine entirely because um, I couldn't just sit around in a, in a room. Um, it's a very solitary activity, and I do love that bit, but not all the time. And you also need to look around at life and draw on life when you want to be creative, um, and that probably doesn't just apply to writing, but probably to lots of other creative endeavours. Um, and patient stories are really interesting. Now, I don't, I don't use any individual patient story. I, I couldn't. That's patient confidentiality being breached. But... My stories are an amalgamation often of experiences that I've, I've come through that the patient, the young patient dying of cancer, for instance, unfortunately, we do come across that in our job. Some, some stories, as they say, um, fact is stranger than fiction. Who would have believed? We, we, I remember once we had a um, poor lady, two husbands in a row died of Hodgkin's lymphoma. It's a rare cancer. I mean, what's the chance of getting two husbands with Hodgkin's lymphoma, a, a disease that's often quite curable, and then both dying? So, so yes, there's a lot of um, stories out there. You draw on a lot of emotion. You see the worst and best sides of people as well, um, and, and you see um, a, a lot of range of human emotion. And um, so, so I think they really interrelate to each other. Um, I think my dream would be to work three or four days a week and then write. So I might get there one day, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. um, it, I was thinking about this on the way down, um, driving down the coast, and uh, it, it happens for me in three stages. So the first stage is writing and medicine were completely separate in my life. And uh, I would go home from medicine and write. And in medicine, I would have lots of lists and, you know, histories, problem lists, investigation, management, double check, double check, double check, double check. Um, and I'd go home and then write with no boundary. And it was relaxing. It essayed a different part of my brain. Uh, I could um, dream, imagine, transport myself and I'd never be in trouble or kill somebody, you know? <laughs> no one would ever ask me a question um, about thrombolytic pathways or something like that and humiliate me on raw ground. Um, so one was a haven towards the other and also access the deepest, oldest part of me, the bit that wanted to get the girl. And the girl over the years has changed to all sorts of different things and it's no longer a, a real girl, it's just to charm, to make something pretty, beautiful, to bring home a picture to my mum and say, it's of a spacecraft, mum. And she goes, it's a really nice spacecraft, son, and put it on the fridge. That's the only motivation, really, for anything I ever do in my life, the older I get. Um, and um, so they were big, 
big refuges, and I think we all have that in medicine, a place to go to get away where you don't have to think so hard, um, or you can delight a little bit. After a while, what started to happen is um, I would go to work and think, why do we see everybody by, for 15 minutes? Because creativity is about riffing, bubbling up ideas, you know, throwing out the bad ones, keeping the good ones, developing them, riffing, riffing again and riffing again and riffing again, learning to play like a three-year-old in your head to channel that inner three-year-old. Um, and so I'd come into medicine and the inner three-year-old would be going, why is it 15 minutes? Because it doesn't feel finished. Um, okay, but it must be because that's what everyone does. And shit, I don't know anything. I'm a kid from South Auckland that should never have got into med school and is still reconsidering his calling to the Adventist ministry. Um, so for years I'd just ignore that and think, well, that's dumb. And why is our room always grey or tan? You know, why? wherever I go, they're grey or tan rooms. Um, so I'd start to question the structures um, of medicine, the physical structures, our time constraints, our economic models, our um, the way our rooms are set up to reflect no personality at all, not to teach or to invite or to create imagination or joy or to nurture the consultation, but just to be yuck, really, um, functional. And so then creativity in my writing life leaked back into medicine and my room became colourful and pink and yellow, full of um, whiteboards and superheroes and books that you could give people. I started to bake cakes for people. We changed the length of time you'd spend seeing a person and I discovered that consultations have a resonance point, that some are five minutes in the context of a larger relationship, some are an hour long, but if you find the resonant point, then it's deeply satisfying for both people, that it's not me consulting with the person, the patient's consulting with me, and it becomes a different beast, just by changing the parameters. And I started to see that the way we set things up is really dumb, or not thinking, or it works in one situation, and then you just stamp it on every situation, that there was no thinking involved whatsoever, or a situation created by managers and then accepted by doctors because of our big accepting brain that we have, um, and, and we're head down getting busy anyway. The third stage, and that, that made me happy in medicine, I rediscovered a joy in medicine just by changing those things, but they were structural things. The third thing, and I just feel like reporting this long, longitudinal study of what it's like to be a writer and a doctor back to my brothers and sisters. After a while, I started to see the consultation as a living, beating beast with arms and legs and anatomies. And creativity gave voice and named people in the room, gave the unseen shape, okay? So if I was with an old dude who was a Kiwi joker, my dad would come into the room and I would invoke my dad because my dad knew how to be with that man, okay? If there was an old queer Māori, then Auntie Rongo would come into the room and say, fire, come on, hey, what? And she would sit in the room. If I'm seeing a three-year-old who doesn't, no, 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 won't let me look in her ear, then my daughter's in the room. You know, baby, come on, baby. Yeah, all my... So those people would enter the room and they would not be controlled by me at some point, but just control themselves, run amok. And the patient would fracture into a hundred different aspects of themselves. So my tribe interacted with their tribe. I would come with my iwi then, yeah? Yeah. Um, in a sense, using that in a metaphorical sense, the iwi of pieces that I am. And they would run off and nurture, listen, distract, chat to iwi on the other side. And I found that you could, it was a three dimensional space, and you could move it and shape it, and that energies could transfer across the gap. 
um, and that people could feel nurtured and held, and that a whole lot of medicine could happen just in the room, even without a knife, a bandage, a pill, a script pad, anywhere, just by tones of voice, by where you shifted, by denting this three-dimensional blob, hmm? and by creativity made me name it and imagine it into shape. Yeah? Um, then you're knee deep in the heart of creativity. Yeah? It's throbbing and beating. And I saw the consultation as a, as a way of touching somebody else, holding them, being held. Um, you guys all know that when a consultation fractures out of an interaction and becomes deeply intimate. And it's like, no one ever told me about this. All the lectures I've ever had at medical school, all the shit about holes and bones, and nobody told me at the heart of what we do is this intimacy. But I knew it from poetry immediately. So it leaked back in then. And I think, wow, it's the great neglected medicine of medicine. And we don't know what we're doing in our own rooms. But I can see it now and shape it. And I give it form and my iwi and my people. My, and, and I don't mean iwi from a Māori perspective because I'm not Māori, but I mean my fractured selves. Yeah, my wounded selves, my joyful selves. Uh, but these moments of interaction. And so that's, I think, how creativity has leaked right into the deep structures, like quantum consultations, and where you dissolve and loop, and people loop into each other, and then out again and safe. But something has passed. Yeah? Um, and in the context of general practice, where you can do that over time, so it has three-dimensional space, um, it's remarkable, you know? And so the joy I feel just in poetry becomes a joy that can be felt in medicine in the same intimacies. If you fall in love with a fucking zip, how, when you're with a human being who's sore, you can palpate the consultation, you know, is it sore here? Is it sore there? Is it sore there? You know, and, and no one's even spoken, yeah? Um, so that's how I think it's powerful. I didn't know that when I started. It's just a complete and utter accident. But from a life of reporting on shit that happens, which is what we do, it's like, and we're in consultation. All of a sudden, we see what we're doing. It, but it took me 20, you know, 15 to 20 years to see it. Um, oh, um, there's a... There's a concept I learnt when I started doing performing arts, which is about, it's, it's called being present. And it's really just about being in the room as yourself. And then because you're fully in the room, you can then stretch out and meet other people with your presence, which is, I think, what you're talking about. Other people might define it as mindfulness, which, you know, you can do courses for. But, you know, I don't think you need a course. I think you, it's the concept of just being present. And what strikes me, I mean, we don't have anyone of, of Māori heritage on stage, and we, this, is a, this is, you know, hopefully something will be remedied next year. But it does, to me, my understanding of, you know, whakawhanangatanga, you know, that is the concept of being generous with yourself to meet other people because that is part of your therapeutic relationship. So actually, our concept of Western medicine is the thing that's lacking. Other people, other, other doctors knew it all the time. Other healers, don't you think? I think it's, I think it's in Western medicine. I just don't think we've talked about it. Um, I remember, as a TI, watching Prof Scott examine an old woman's abdomen at Middlemore Hospital. Never, ever forget it. And I thought, what's he doing? He's just doing something that no one else does. And he was like Dr. Spock. <laughs> and it was like, there was heaps of white coats in the room, but there was just two of them. It, there was, he was just laser-like. 
and I never knew what he was, but I always knew that there's pay dirt there. And it's taken me 24, maybe it has to take that time, I don't know. Um, you yeah, know, I, I just what you were saying. I, I guess that's what writing has taught me, and, and maybe I should have learnt it sooner. But um, is to try and give myself to the patient and the interaction, not to be staring at the computer or trying to write notes. I don't write notes in consultation anymore, which is partly because of maybe I'm senior too. Um, but to just put down your pen, turn around, sit there, and listen, and, and don't just like start quizzing them straight away. Just say how are you, and actually listen to them. And as you say, actually be all yourself there, not sit there going, I haven't got much time, which can be really hard to do. Um, yeah. um, we've got some questions from you people, so I'm just going to throw them in, because they're quite good. Um, so, actually, can I borrow the microphone? Yeah, it's nice to have that one. Thank you. Oh, that, that's awesome. Okay. Uh, in order of popularity, can we make an argument for DHB sanctioned sabbatical leave in a topic which is not strictly medical, but which we are creatively passionate about? Or are the DHB overlords the sole arbiters of what we can study for their benefit? <laughs> I don't know if you guys want to comment on that or if you want to treat it as rhetorical. <laughs> that would be great. I could apply for a three month um, sabbatical and uh, do a, you know, what do you call them? Uh, a writing retreat, that would be lovely. But, yeah, I'm not sure if we could convince them of the merits of that. I think it would be great. I have a confession to make, which is uh, when I go on, conferen on overseas conferences, I um, actually spend all my evenings doing art CME. Um, I, complete, I mostly ignore the social activities um, that, you know, um, it's terrible <laughs> to admit in front of a in front of my colleagues, but um, I basically just hit the theatres and um, and s just just do the stuff because just like with um, in medicine, it's about experience, it's about seeing what other people are doing, it's about understanding how they're thinking. I have to do art CME, and I go and use that opportunity of being in a different city in a different culture to go out and do that. Um, I, that's not a solution uh, for the, or even an answer to the question. I'm just confessional at the moment. <laughs> um, oh, two responses, I guess. You know, um, I just find DHBs a pain in a giant ass, and I, I just don't know why they exist, and they frustrate the life out of me. And I'm really angry that doctors aren't angry about the way we get shoved into doing medicine by boxes, and it, it outrages me. So, but given that they exist, um, yeah, for sure. Like, I, I was lucky enough to get a, uh, a Fulbright for six months and went to do a medical humanities, some uh, research on med medical humanities in Boston. And for six months, is the, all that, that change from the first relationship between creativity and medicine, when I got back, I went straight into level two, where I started to bring creativity back into the room and into the time structures, and very quickly after that, into the actual quantum consultation. And that all happened by stopping and, stand and looking back. So I'm not so sure it's important what you do with that time, but just time to reflect on what you're doing, because medicine makes us go so fast. There's always stuff to do that you don't often get to walk up the hill and look back down on it and go, am I happy? Or question its big structures. So I think anything that gives us respite to check the big structures is useful because it definitely changed my practice. I didn't know it was going to do that, but simply taking the time out um, made me reflect once I got off the merry-go-round, I suppose. And then when I got back on, it's like, no, I want the merry-go-round to go this way um, instead of that way. Um, I, I just wanted to say, to say I, that we're all kind of, you know, obviously we're very arts-focused, but I just wanted to say that, um, like, whatever your jam that you need 
to be your full self. Um, this includes all the other stuff, all the other things that people do to make themselves happy or because they're, they're driven to it, um, such as sports, such as other crafts and hobbies. It's, it's re you know, I, I think that we should be allowed to explore this uh, because it is part of us becoming better doctors. You know, we need to bring all of ourselves. So, you know, this is part of our training. This is part of our, our ongoing development as, as doctors. However, if you guys wanted to test whether or not you can get your DHB to agree. There is a conference happening in a couple uh, next weekend uh, called Creative Careers in Medicine. Now, I don't actually even know the people. They're Australians who are organising this. But there is a Facebook page. There's also, you can just find it by Googling Creative Careers in Medicine. It's being held virtually uh, on a weekend. So you guys could sign up and see if your DHB will pay back the CME on that if you guys want it. I don't know. It's quite an interesting um, conference schedule. So look it up. Okay, I've got another, it's kind of rhetorical, but I think you may wish to comment. Why isn't writing, oh, it's just dropped down. Why isn't writing a history well taught at med school, like nutrition, by writers? So I guess nutrition is taught by nutritionists, and so why isn't yeah. writing a history taught by writers? Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I remember doing my psychiatry run in Christchurch, and it was community psychiatry, and the psychiatrist wanted me to try and be quite creative, creative with my letters. I wasn't quite sure what he wanted. He really wanted me to, and, and I think I failed at that, actually. I, I don't think he was very impressed with what I came out with. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, I feel like it's a completely different part of your brain. I do do a lot of academic writing, but it's very structured and, and very quite different, but I do find my creative writing flows into that because I find it quite easy. It's when I get to, got to the stats on my PhD that I tore my hair out, but the actual writing it was fine. Um, so, so, yeah, perhaps there does need to be more of a, a focus on that. Um, there's so much to cram in, isn't there? Um, and, and some people just naturally, I think, really good at it. You even see that in people's emails, and, and some people just aren't. Everyone's got such different strengths. I saw a Twitter thread on, um, among the surgeons recently, and just shout out to all the surgeons in the room. Um, sorry about all the... Um, the, the bad things that physicians say about you, they're not true. Um, because you guys started talking about how you put telling details in your histories. So you put like, you know, um, I mean that, that old joke about the paediatrician always knows the name of the family's pet. You guys were talking about that. You were like, so you know, this guy, his, help, his chief hobby is fixing old tractors and you put that in your history because that's, like for me, I, I sometimes do that in my detail because I'm terrible at remembering people's names and stories. So if I put that in my letter, the next time when they come in to see me, I immediately hook into the rest of their story. It's like a little, it's actually a little trick and I see lots of nods around the room. So it sounds like lots of people do that. And there are, you know, people were lamenting that we're losing the last of the great storytellers, you know, like um, people like um, uh, Leo, who, you know, a paediatrician and, and Hart, who used to, who was famous for how amazing his letters were. And I just want to say that there are some um, people and uh, there, there's a registrar, for example, in Northland who um, can match Leo and his storytelling and his letters so the and and the beauty of his writing. So I want to you know say to all the the young table over there, um, please do encourage you know make sure that you have that beauty of your own voice coming through when you write notes when you write letters because that's important. And you know that you now your now your patients are receiving those letters. So it's good that they kind of know your voice as well because I think that's really important to them. So. Uh, slightly told off actually by a haematologist in Christchurch about one of my letters and I'd said, oh, the man was quite unkempt and he attended in his dressing gown and he said, oh, you might want to tone that down. But <laughs> I actually thought it was quite important, like, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking of breast surgeons writing about your boobs and things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, just like, oh, wow. That would be a great letter to read. <laughs> um, no, um, oh, one of, the, one of the neat things I think that someone challenged me to do is because I, I work with adolescents and I, for a time I did gateway reports for young people. So gateway report is a, is a big health report really written for any young person entering Oranga Tamariki care. Um, so there's usually big stories going on for those young people. And challenged, because you know, doctors write them in particular ways, you know, full of problem lists and da 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 da. And 
just challenged us at a conference to write those reports to the young people. So for a couple of years while I was doing them, I just, it was just a neat conceit as a writer to say, okay, I'm gonna write this letter to Aroha. And the writer in me really wanted the challenge of it because I love the vernacular of young people. Writers love vernacular. We love the way people talk. It's like found stories and poems and novels all over the place. Um, and so I wrote the Gateway Report in the vernacular of small town New Zealand, you know, live in. And what I noticed is it stopped me being pejorative because you can't say ADHD, ADD, you know, ODD, oppositional defiant disorder. What the fuck is that? You say, you know, oh, Aroha, man, it seems like you've been running into some problems, sister, you know. Or, Dear Aroha, it was so good to see you at the clinic on Thursday. What an amazing story you have. I really wanted to say how humbled I am, just how, yeah, how awesome it was to listen to you. But I can see there's some things that really hurt, and I can see school is a really hard place for you. What you told me was da 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 da. And it, they got longer but it also forced me to put things in a way that a young person can hear. So they became therapeutic and not just an opportunity for therapy anyway, not just um, uh, something written from one expert to another expert that completely cuts out of the loop the person in question, which almost by definition becomes pejorative. So I think definitely changing the language around can actually helps change some, uh, creates again therapies where we never use them, where we just think, oh, this is just about giving information, you know? Um, I remember for a, for a time I was very lucky to look after um, Hilary Baxter, who has passed away a few years ago, and Hilary is um, uh, the daughter of Jackie Sturm and Jim Baxter, and she was a poet in her own right, and l life hadn't gone well for her at times, and, you know, she really struggled in the back part of her life and she would come into the clinic and we'd schedule her in the last visit and she would chat and we would yarn and um, you know and I'd read letters that came back from organisations with se secondary care that had seen her so I remember going and finding her book of poetry and photocopying the whole thing and putting it in the back of her notes so that anyone who read her notes would see what this mind was like um, and see the beating heart of her and see her art. Um, yeah, so small, you know, I think being able to per put an element of that person, uh, capture an element of the humanity of that person in notes is great. I did want to say as well that, um, you know, med medical teaching, medical student. Um, teaching has shifted a lot since I went and there are humanities programs in both medical schools now which you, you teach at Glenn right are you are you running are you involved no yeah <laughs> but but I mean you know um, there, there are lots of you know I think we are shifting our, our medical culture is shifting away from third person back to first person which it should be and that we are teaching, hopefully, our young people to, our young doctors, to understand story. But I think that the burden then passes to us after they come out of you know, their lectures and come into our wards and clinics, that we need to model that behaviour. And I think all of us are indeed master storytellers. We all have our own styles. And I'm sure that many of us do take it upon ourselves to model it. And I think I just want to, you know, say um, that is amazing work. And hopefully we are creating a generational shift. Drama. Yeah. Drama with water. I'm very drawn to, I, well, Erin. I'm very drawn to pursuing creative endeavours, but after suppressing creative seemingly frivolous pursuits for years, if not decades, it's hard to allow it out. I also fear being a failure at it, given the late start. It feels scary. Uh, there's also a question about suffering from imposter syndrome regarding your writing and how you overcome it, and they're two 
um, sort of related I've still got things. imposter syndrome <laughs> um, in, in both medicine sometimes too and, and writing. Um, I, I guess to answer the first question, I don't think it's too late. I, I picked it up in two, end of 2011 and, and look where I am now. I've, I've you know, done quite a lot. <laughs> um, so, so I don't think it's too late. I think you can just you can get started with a writing course. I couldn't afford to do that when I was a teenager. It was way out of reach. Um, and that really helped um, me get some links and, and sort of set me off a little bit. In terms of the imposter syndrome, I think that's just the nature of um, often who you are. Um, so my first four books... Um, well, four of my books are young adult and two are adult. So th this is my second adult book. And I was at the Christchurch Writers' Festival the other week. And I feel quite comfortable speaking to young adults. But when I was speaking to the adult audience, again, I felt like an, a slight imposter syndrome. This book ended up in the listener best 101 books of 2020. And I went, oh, how did I end up in there? Um, you know, I, I, again, I still have imposter syndrome. So I, I think um, that's just the way some people are. But it doesn't mean you're not good. It's just the way it is. Um, to Erin, who's out there, I don't know if you want to identify yourself, um, but um, any, any other people that, that feel that they've lost it uh, or lost, lost, lost time, um, I mean, you've got three people sitting in front of you who, you know, have spent substantial amounts of time not writing and... It is hard, it's just like anything. You have to decide that you want to do it and then make do some steps to go and do it. There's so many different um, online courses and so on. Um, but also, I think before lockdown happened, I started a little writing group for doctors um, just in my... Uh, just at, ho at at my house, uh, and um, and there was some really good talk over there, and I think there's quite a lot of people that would like to understand that. And the journey is pretty, you know, like there's so many different online courses and other face-to-face -face courses that you can do that I'm more than happy to pass information on on for the ASM web website because I do get, get asked that question a lot. But my personal offer to you is that. Um, if you write your email down on the list or, or message me, I can add you to a list and we can keep running the club now that we're on level one because I quite like um, sharing what I've learnt. Um, not that I know more than anyone else, it's just that um, I quite like sharing it and hearing what other people come up with. And I, I personally do, you know, I have good evidence um, from these experiences that doctors are good writers. I, j just to say, too, um, you can do night classes. That's what I did for my creative writing course. I couldn't spare daytime, but I did a 30-week, um, once a week, three hours a week. So. Yeah. 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 Um, I th you know, like, I'd just embrace your inner imposter, I'd say. I'd just add him to the iwi. I've got thousands of... <laughs> Little imposter Glens running around, an imposter GP, an imposter fucking Seventh Day Adventist minister, <laughs> an imposter writer. It's like, hey, brother, welcome to the club. Why? What are we gonna do about this? Um, so I think, just love them, man. You know, love them and chuckle at yourself because it's a stage you go through. Hey, eh? this is you go through that uh, and. You know, you must have had that with your specialty too. I don't know a doctor that's like, what the fuck do I do now? And, but over time, one day you wake up and you think, actually, I do know what to do. And, and you do embrace yourself. Some, you know, but then if you get out of your field slightly, oh, yeah, little imposter dude comes rocking on back real quick. Um, so I embrace them. And remember, don't make it heavy. Yeah? Don't make it heavy. The best lesson I ever had on writing was from my five or six year old daughter and her cousin. Yeah? So they were playing with plastic ponies and toilet rolls and um, shiny things. <laughs> and they had made a horse school in like a horse airport in, in my lounge room. And like, um, a horse world, really. It went for quite a few square metres, and I would have to tiptoe around it for a weekend. And I, I was doing something round the corner, and I could hear them talking. And 
And it's the best lesson I've had in creativity because they, they solved their problems as they went and they didn't think too hard about it. And the conversation went something like this. Hi, my name's Beautiful Darling Pony. Hi, I'm Yellow Amazing Pony. Would you like to ride to the Magic Kingdom? Yeah, I'd love to ride. Are you my cousin, Yellow Amazing Pony? Yes, I'm your cousin, Beautiful Darling Pony. <laughs> Quickly, let's go up to the kingdom. Oh no, I'm Yellow Amazing Pony. It's Tiger Killing Pony. Careful, he is going to kill us. No, get our cousin. Tiger Killing Pony, Killing Person, Horse. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now we're safe. Oh, you're beautiful, beautiful darling pony. You're amazing yellow, yellow amazing pony. <laughs> and, and it would just loop. <laughs> and and I, I just wanted to go in and bite them in the jugular and suck the creativity out <laughs> as a shriveled up old man, you know, that... They know how to not self-censor. There's no imposter syndrome in there. Everything is possible. The world, the world of the imagination. They had thousands of little iwi in them. And um, so I think go back to doing that. Just put it on the paper. There is a craft in writing, but writing teaches you itself. By doing it over and over again, you will just get better like everything. There is a craft in it. I love the craft. I uh, respect the craft, um, and there's another part of me that's really tough on the craft, because I love what it is that you take out of a poem until it floats. Yeah, I love to know what it, when do I just take the right amount of words out, and then it shoots away. Um, so the craft is to be respected, but you learn it by doing it, and, and being three, four, five, you know. It is time to close the session with each of you giving us another reading. So, who's going first? Okay. All right. So, um, so another spoiler alert. I guess I'm reading bits that I think um, relate to what we've talked about um, in our sessions throughout the day. So this is later on in the book, and, and Rory's just been really—he's having lots of panic attacks and flashbacks, and he's really not having a good time. After peeling into his driveway and killing the engine, Rory sat motionless for a minute or so, gripping the steering wheel. Shouldn't have checked my email. Shouldn't have, shouldn't have. If he hadn't, he might still be sitting next to Jody on the couch, happily oblivious. Shite. He thumped the dashboard and got out of the car. Once inside the house, he slumped against the wall in the hallway and read the email again. It was from the complaints officer at Wellington Hospital. It was addressed not only to him, but also to a bunch of other people including the head of anaesthetics, their business manager, and the chief of critical care. Please find attached the HDC report to which you have all provided input. The commissioner has sought clarification in a number of areas. Could you please provide your individual responses where applicable and send them to me by 5 p.m. Monday 14th of March so I can forward the final report to the commissioner? His heart racing, Roy shut down his email. He couldn't bear to do it tonight, couldn't even cope with opening the attachment. And tomorrow would be Friday, fucking Friday. The paediatric list loomed, another collection of kids needing their tonsils and adenoids removed, or grommets inserted into their tiny ears. Every Friday morning, Rory wove a, sorry, rode a monstrous wave of panic. Every Friday afternoon was a come down, a relief. Only two days ago, he'd been hiking the Heafy track with Jody and their friends, his mind floating free. He'd dared to think things might be getting better. Wrong, wrong, wrong. How could he be an anaesthetist if he had a panic attack every time he went near a kid? And what if he was only weeks away from being stood down, disciplined, even struck off the medical register? He pushed away from the wall, his mind white blank, but his body moving down the hallway and into the bedroom. The syringe was where he'd left it in his underwear drawer. After setting it on top of the dressing table, he ran his hand along the top shelf of the wardrobe until he felt a plastic bag. Rory peeled the ziplock open and extracted a needle. Propofol, onset of action, approximately 30 seconds. He rifled through another drawer and selected the longest socks he had, his tramping socks. After knotting one above his left elbow, he screwed the needle onto the end of the syringe and removed the cap. He prodded the bulging vein in the crook of his elbow, blue and springy, just right. With a rapid intake of breath, Rory inserted the needle and drew back on the syringe to check he was in the vein. A line of crimson flashed into the white liquid. 
blood on snow. Tidy, he whispered, and depressed the plunger. Ten, nine, eight, boom. Okay. Um, by way of explanation, the book I'm reading from is a, um, actually, it started as an email correspondence between myself and my friend Michelle Poles, who's a novelist. Um, she decided, she um, approached me when she realised through social media that I was um, pregnant, um, just like she was, and she said, you know how you meant to write all this down was your first child and you didn't? Well, now we both have our second chances. So we started this email correspondence. Um, so I'm reading towards the end of the book um, because we decided to stop it when our eldest children were five. And this is um, my second... Uh, in, this, in this part I'm reading is my second child, the one who, um, the one who starts the book by being born. So big dark world. Mr. Three has just started kindy. Like all new kids, he fluctuates in his enthusiasm for it. Some days he'll be happily marching in with his flashing robot gumboots, pushing the big girls aside to get at the puzzle table. Other days he's hunching down in his car seat and refusing to leave. He knows how to simultaneously flop and tense in a way that not only defies the rules of physics, but exponentially increases my risk of back injury should I attempt any removal. We thought he had settled in well, but then one morning as he was giving me my morning cuddle in bed, a warm spidery weight of arms and legs and cheeks, he murmured, Mummy, I'm dumb. It turned out that one of the bigger boys had bullied him in the sandpit. He had been bullied and he was only three. The kindy staff said, Oh, we look out for that and stop it if we see it. Inside, I was a raging warrior mother wanting to find the boy and speak to him, but outside, I just flopped my hands uselessly and said, OK. Is this where it begins? Is this where we learn to accept that there are always bigger kids and nastier voices, and that if we just accept them, life can go on? A flip book of my own experiences being called Ching Chong Chinaman on the bush track to primary school and hitting the boy in question with my swimming bag. But then I had no fear and my tactics gained me a dedicated protector and friend. At 11, starting a new school, I had no such brash answer for the young blonde teacher who put me down, nor for the classmates who dictated where I would sit and enforced this by taking my belongings and throwing them out the window. The scars deepened as my skin thickened. I learned to cultivate intellect and sometimes allies as my defence. When that didn't work, I ran away to the library. I consoled myself with the thought that when I grew up, the bullying would stop. But it doesn't, of course. In such, high -powered, in such a high-powered profession as mine, big personalities are rife. The era in which I trained as a doctor was the sunset of professors who'd believed in teaching by humiliation and outside the learning environment, the jockeying for position to be noticed, to be picked for sought after training positions was already beginning. When I finally got my dream job as a trainee in paediatric respiratory medicine, I was ground down by the very professor who was supposed to be mentoring me. Once again, I employed my primary tactic of running away. I left medicine, temporarily, as it turned out, and enrolled in an arts degree. And now, my helplessness when faced with the same situation and the small person I should be protecting, how can I solve something that I have never managed to solve for myself? For all my training in child development, all I can do is hold him close and whisper, you're not dumb, you're a smart boy. I love you so much. I know his smartness will protect him and it will deepen the scars. I know how he'll dig into himself trying to figure out why people do this to him, what personal failing is the cause, for such is the power of bullies that they can take away our certainties. And all I can do is wrap him in so much certainty, so much love, 
that the bullies can never penetrate to his core. I love you. You're not dumb. I love you so, so much. There's a problem being down the end of the row, isn't it, really? Um, um, I did have a poem lined up for you, but I thought, um, uh, seems there's um, somebody out there that feels like an imposter, I should also be an imposter. Um, uh, this is a poem from a book that I've just finished called Letters to Young People, and they're poems written to young people who I've seen at our clinic in Horofenua, and they're kind of like those things you wish you had said better, um, and, and, and it's been a neat project writing to the young people. Um, and then I take the poem back to that young person and give it to them so they can have a read of it. And I ring them up and say, can you come in? I've got something for you. They all think they've got cancer. Um, yeah, and it's like, yeah, no, you haven't got cancer. It's all right, I've just written you a poem. <laughs> If you want to feel like an imposter, do that to kids in Levin. Um, and, uh, um, anyway, I got to the end of the book, that, uh, um, and I realised I'd written to the young people in the voice of a 56-year-old white um, middle-class man, you know? In my voice, in my type of poems, 21st century written English poetry. And it's not really a world uh, that they're not really interested in that sort of poetry. They love the idea that I might have written a poem for them and that I was inspired by them. So I thought, before I finished, I just got to that realisation at the end of the project, I thought, I will write something in the poetry that this young man might listen to. And that, of course, is spoken word, hip-hop, um, rap. So I thought, well... It's a genre of poetry, isn't it, really? So if I can write poetry, I should be able to essay hip-hop and rap and do some research, you know, talk to my daughter, talk to the young people, say, what do I do, you know? <laughs> Motherfuckers! And get some lessons. I thought, well, I need... If it's... Otherwise, it's just me telling you from my voice. So anyway... This is what resulted. I feel like a complete imposter. And, um, but it was a hell of a lot of fun. And this is for a young man called Shelby. And writing him, uh, who was a young boy who had some really bad orthodontic problems, and we raised some money at the clinic to get him to, a, to the dentist. Um, and he now has this amazing smile. And it took a bit... And I would drive him up once a, year, once a w uh, month to get his braces adjusted and things like that. So we'd have these great conversations in the car and, and eat fried chicken on the way home and, <laughs> and have these amazing rambling conversations. And he would listen to them, his music and I would ask him questions about it. Anyway, it just felt wrong to write him one of my white man poems, so my old white man poems. So this is about his teeth and... Um, uh, about being an imposter and please forgive me um, uh, it's called Eruptions it's, uh, for Shelby What's up brother, sup brother kicking it up and such brother got this bit of patter tripping through the grey matter gotta say first up good to see you much love Better say it twice, too. Cause everyone is kinda too, I see that in you sometimes. Some shadow, some shine, kinda sentence, kinda rhyme. Like the light come through a blind. One brother from the hood. One brother from the hood, another from the good book. Ali Fraser, doof, doof, uppercut and left hook. See the fight go back and forth, cavalry and crazy horse. Frodo and that bloody ring, Jesus and Gethsemane. I remember that day, holding up the x-ray. One tooth in the way, the other sitting in the shade. Sometimes I think that's just like you. Kinda rough, kinda smooth, I'm cheering for your big heart for the light to beat the duck I'm cheering for Red Riding Hood gobble up that ugly wolf back in the old days back before the bible says for the shit in old ways other side of ice age we were fish go figure that carried teeth upon our back took about a million years for them to end up in our head all I'm saying round about out of shadow of a doubt none of us is said and done most of us are still to come Robert Frost came across in the yellow wood once undisturbed unperturbed undercurbed to past the verge to the left be my guest to the right she'll be right in the wild 
crocodile took the one less travelled by. Later made the inference that made all the difference. Even Moe took stock floating on his top knot. Had to get old school before he got too cool. Had to try the right door. Had to do the either or. Had to rub an old jaw. Find the man inside the boy. That's all I want to say. Love you brother anyway. Be who you were meant to be. Write your own damn history. This mihi's all done off the paper on the tongue. See you one day in the sun. Tahiru atorufa. See you in the by and by. Love you brother. Coke and pie. Oh, see you in the by and by. Love you, brother. Coke and pie. <laughs> well, that was really cool. Thank you very much. It's all right. <laughs> There's always another time. Um, um, now, uh, Murray Barclay is going to close day one. He's got um, some reflections and some important notices, so please just stay put. But can you all join me just one more time and thank these three amazing writers who docked us? <laughs>